Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the House Chamber for the State of Judiciary Address. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize some of our honored guests with us this, e this afternoon. Uh, first of all, up front, please welcome Governor Eric Holcomb. Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch. <laughs> Senate leaders, President Pro Tem Roderick Bray. <laughs> Minority floor leader, Greg Taylor. Minor House Minority Law Eater, Phil Giaquina. In the main gallery, we welcome state elected office holders, Attorney General Todd Rikita. Secretary of State Holly Sullivan. Treasurer, Kelly Mitchell. And Auditor, Tara Klutz. Also in the main gallery, we welcome the family of current Supreme Court Justices, Jim Rush, husband of Chief Justice Rush. and Helene Bishop, sister of Chief Justice Rush. And we are also pleased to welcome former Supreme Court Chief Justice Brent Dixon. now take our awkward two-minute pause before we uh, introduce the Chief Justice. So stay in your seats for just two minutes. She is. Yes, she is. Yeah, she is. She is. Transmitter.
At this time, we welcome the Chief Justice, the Legislative Escorts, and all appellate and trial court judges. <laughs> Joining Chief Justice Rushes, Rush is being escorted by Senator Suglick, Senator Liz Brown, Senator Tim Lannon, Senator Lonnie Randolph, Representative Jerry Tor, Representative Wendy McNamara, Representative Reagan Hatcher and Representative Matt Pierce. Chief Justice is joined by her Supreme Court colleagues, colleagues, Justices Stephen David, Mark Massa, Jeffrey Slaughter, and Christopher Goff. And she's joined by a Court of Appeal judges, Chief Justice Cale Bradford, Edward Najem, L. Mark Bailey, Melissa May, Margaret Robb, Elaine Brown, Rudy Pyle, Robert Ortiz, Elizabeth Tavitas, Leanna Weissman, and Derek Moulter. It is my honor to introduce the 52nd Lieutenant Governor for the State of Indiana, Suzanne Crouch. Yep. Members of the Joint Assembly, pursuant to Section 3 of Article 7 of the Constitution of the State of Indiana, this joint session of the two houses of the Indiana General Assembly is now convened for the purpose of hearing a message from the Chief Justice of Indiana. It is my privilege to present to you the distinguished Chief Justice of Indiana, the Honorable Loretta Rush. Welcome to the State of the Judiciary. Governor Holcomb, Lieutenant Governor Crouch, President Pro Tem Bray, Speaker Houston, members of the General Assembly, Chief Judge Bradford, Judge Najem, who will be retiring this year, colleagues and friends, it is so great to be here. Thank you. It's always a privilege to address you in this magnificent chamber. We're one of the few states in the country where all three branches of government are housed in one building. While each of our branches has independent obligations, our proximity to each other cultivates opportunities to work together for the benefit of so many Hoosiers. Thank you for being together with us. As Chief Justice of Indiana, it's my constitutional responsibility to report to you on the State of Indiana Courts, my eighth such address. And the message I offer today is one of perseverance. 
Thank you. <laughs> These last two years, your judiciary has embraced solutions to keep courts operational, resulting in the resolution of two million cases. But success is not measured solely by the number of cases we decide. Why? Because the Indiana Constitution's Open Courts Clause promises every Hoosier a fair, impartial, and accessible justice system, and we're delivering on that promise. Yes, your Indiana Supreme Court thoughtfully decides cases as our Constitution requires, but the Constitution further charges us with critical administrative responsibilities. Responsibilities that are vital to the rule of law because a judge's decision-making is only as good as the legal system in which it takes place. Across our 92 counties, your dedicated trial court judges confront an increasingly complex array of criminal, business, family, housing, debt cases. In many ways, courts have become the government emergency room for society's worst afflictions, substance abuse, mental health, domestic violence, homelessness, the challenges brought to courtrooms each day are the same challenges facing your constituents. And like you, we are determined to find solutions. We share in the governor's stated desire to uphold Indiana's reputation as a place Hoosiers want to live, work, play, study, and stay. Thank you, Governor Holcomb. Today, I will highlight four critical components of our constitutional responsibilities. First, increasing public trust. We are implementing initiatives to increase, to increase confidence in the judiciary. And why is public trust so critical to the judiciary? Because it's the judiciary's currency. As Alexander Hamilton famously pointed out in the Federal's papers, and don't worry, I'm not gonna break out in song. Um, we have no influence over either the sword or the purse, true. But we do have tremendous influence over Hoosier's trust in government. Every day, thousands of citizens across Indiana enter our courtrooms where they are guaranteed a fair, impartial, and accessible justice system. So we must operate a system, a justice system, that bolsters that currency. Second, strengthening Hoosier families. We are instituting court reforms to better serve vulnerable and endangered children and adults, to better support our veterans, and to better help our families navigate their way through divorce, child custody, evictions. And in doing so, we are also addressing the ever-increasing number of Hoosiers entering our courtrooms with substance abuse disorder and severe mental illness. Third, improving public safety. We're expanding problem-solving courts, and we remain committed to working with all justice partners to safely implement pretrial reform. Fourth and finally, modernizing our courts. We are innovating. From recently completing one statewide case management system to increasing the speedy resolution of business disputes. We're committed to leveraging technology to better deliver justice across our state. These efforts that I'm going to talk about today are foundational for fulfilling that constitutional promise of providing a fair, impartial, and accessible justice system for every person in every Indiana community. Thank you. When we're all in this room together, it's apparent we have a tremendous connection, a bond we share because we chose public service. While we took different paths to office, the underlying motivation is the same, to serve the people of our state. And one of the most deeply committed public servants of our time, one we should all aspire to be, is Justice Stephen David. Justice David will step down from the bench this year after nearly 30 years as a judicial branch leader and the longest, the longest serving justice currently on our court. A highly decorated colonel in the U.S. Army, his 28 years of service include tours of duty in Iraq and Guantanamo Bay. 
As a tireless champion of justice, he has selflessly led so many of the court reforms that I'm going to speak with you about today. But you know what? Since Justice Davis has led, has led so many of these initiatives, let's see if we can hear from him. Justice David, would you mind coming up here and briefly updating these fine people? Well, thank you, Chief Justice Rush. You and I have served together for over 20 years. So thanks for sharing just a wee bit of your time today with me. You know, for a nine generation plus Hoosier who grew up in little Ogilville, Indiana, this is a tremendous honor and a pretty cool place to be up here. <laughs> you didn't tell me that my pulse rate would go from 50 to 150 <laughs> in, in a span of less than 10 feet. So okay, let's talk about the modernization of the courts through technology. We now have a unified case management system in every county. I'll say it again for those of you not listening, one statewide case management system with public access. <laughs> with public access, mycase.in.gov with 34 million visits per year. We couldn't have done it without your support, your trust, your confidence. All Hoosiers now have free 24-7 access to court information. And we have our e-filing system that is also in every county. Every week, about 140,000 electronic filings move through the system, paperless, saving millions of dollars for all users, including government agencies. By supporting us, in this journey, we are a more responsive and transparent judiciary. And thank <laughs> and thank you to each and every one of you for your unwavering support for the Commercial Courts Initiative, available statewide. 1,300 cases have moved through this sophisticated system that handles challenging business-to-business -business disputes. It's timely, it's cost-effective, predictable, and fair. So thank you to the Commercial Court Committee, which has listened to the needs of practitioners, corporate counsel, and judges. And a special shout out to Kevin Brinegar of the Indiana Chamber of Commerce, as well as your own Senator Eric Cook and Representative Greg Sturwald. And I hope I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Indiana is a national leader in specialized courts, often called problem-solving courts. They focus on accountability, but also treatment. Accountability and treatment are not mutually exclusive. Together, they are mutually successful. We have 118 of these specialized dockets statewide and 21 more in the planning process, thanks to you. They include drug, family recovery, domestic violence, mental health, and veterans treatment courts. It has been my honor to witness hundreds of people graduate from these extraordinary programs. They are incredibly time-consuming local initiatives. But as a veteran, the son of a veteran, the grandson of a veteran, the father of a veteran, the brother-in-law of a veteran, and the son-in-law of a veteran, and the husband of a Navy officer who's been recalled to active duty for an extended period of time on behalf of every man and woman who's ever served, everyone who is serving, and everyone who will serve. I am truly grateful for your support for these profoundly impactful, life-changing, indeed life-saving programs. Thank you. You. you know, we all have good days and bad days, so if you need to really feel good about what you do, about the good you do, and the support you have given us in this work,
please attend a problem-solving court graduation. You must experience it to really appreciate it. Watch the very police officer who arrested the person for drug use stand with that individual and they hug each other in tears of triumph. Or attend a veterans treatment court graduation where a service member scarred by the experiences and trauma of service, sacrifice, and conflict, who was once willing to give their life for all of us, now has a new life thanks to all of you. It just doesn't get any better than that. And let's talk about public safety, which includes pretrial and criminal justice reform. They allow us to enhance public trust and safeguard constitutional rights. We are working with you, our friends at IPAC, Public Defender's Office, law enforcement, and other stakeholders to build a more constitutionally transparent system to protect due process and equal protection rights while maintaining public safety. We envision transformative, lasting changes where we are not holding low-risk people in county jails. We have 12 counties now certified as pretrial services agencies led by the courts and 30 more in the planning stages. Our goal is simple, to make sure that before trial, the right people are in jail for the right reasons. Nothing more complicated than that. And what about increasing public trust as the Chief Justice referenced? I wear this wristband 24-7 it says the rule of law always. It's the rule of law and the respect for it that separates us from most of the rest of the world. It makes us the envy of most of the world and quite frankly, the enemy of some of it. It is precious, it requires constant care and attention. It takes commitment and work from all of us to ensure that sacred phrase and justice for all. We have launched the Commission on Equity and Access. Don't be afraid of it. We're not. It's all about improving our systems. It's our way of doing a friendly audit of our own processes. And we aren't doing it alone. Thank you, legislators Travis Holman, Greg Taylor, Greg Sturwald, and Reagan Hatcher, along with my vice chairs, Norris Cunningham and Deborah Daniels. Will everyone who is serving on this commission or any of its eight working groups Please stand and accept our most grateful thank you. Thank you. Let me share just one example of strengthening families and children. We have nearly four thousand GAL CASA volunteers serving nearly 22,000 children. With the work of these earth angels, tragedy and sadness is being turned into happiness and hope. Together, together we are figuring out how to do better for our citizens, and that is indeed serving the public. I would like to leave you all with this thought as I turn it back over to the Chief Justice of Indiana. Public service is all about putting others first. It's about giving of your time and talents in ways that may not be fully appreciated until much later. It's about doing what is right every day as best as you can because you care about others. And we, and when I say we, I mean the four of us and my successor, the 16 appellate judges, all of my brothers and sisters, your colleagues wearing the robes here and throughout the state, led by our Chief Justice, just as importantly, inspired by our Chief Justice, just as importantly, supported by our Chief Justice. We are glad to be doubling down on our public service efforts with you in 2022. Thank you.
Thank you, Justice David. I concur, and I'm pretty sure we can get three more votes on that. So, Justice David, you leave behind um, a legacy of exceptionally stronger justice system. And now let's look to the future and ways that we can build on that legacy. Our court recently tasked some of the biggest thinkers in our profession to provide a long-term blueprint for the court system of tomorrow, and here's just a sampling. To improve public safety, we're working on a centralized jail management system. Your jail overcrowding task force identified systemic problems with multiple jail management systems, problems that prevent all of us from collecting and analyzing reliable data. You asked for a solution, we're delivering. Our newly created centralized system will improve public safety by ensuring accurate criminal records, allowing judges to view real-time incarceration status, and alerting community agencies when a supervised individual is arrested. Sharing offender information between jails, courts, community corrections, probation, and all justice partners is vital to public safety and will give you information like you've not had before to guide your policy making in these areas. I'd like all the members of the Jail Overcrowding Task Force, all three branches, work together to stand and accept our thanks. Representative Fry, Representative Sturwald, Representative Ford, Representative Benny. Lots of work to be done still there, but thank you. Second Indiana has some of the highest eviction rates in the country. To find solutions, we are devoting key resources to help landlords and tenants, including piloting a housing court. I need to say thanks and would ask that judge, judges Bob Altice, Jennifer DeGroote, Kimberly Bacon, Kathleen Beliski, as well as landlord and tenant representatives, state leaders, they're all working together to find equitable solutions through the eviction task force. Could you all stand and please accept our thanks? Third, with over 100,000 divorce and paternity cases pending in our courts, we know that Hoosier families are facing an incredibly tough time, both emotionally and economically. The sooner they go to court and resolve differences, the better. So we're implementing a Pathways program that will tailor the court's experience to a family's needs, creating efficiencies in time, scale, and structure. Thank you, Judge Elizabeth Tavides and the members of your Family Law Task Force. Could you stand? Thank you. Fourth and finally, we are leveraging smartphones and online access. We already text message, I'm hearing reminders, scheduling, and confirming deadlines. Now we're piloting a mobile check-in program, and soon some people may not need to come to court at all. A new online platform for dis online dispute resolution will allow court customers resol to resolve their disputes at no cost and on their own time looking to the future. For our, for our final few moments, I want to talk about a remarkable opportunity all of us in this building have to work together to fix a broken mental health system. But if we're going to do it, we must do it together. Last month, I visited Tippecanoe County Circuit Court Judge Sean Pearson and heard a familiar story. His court is overwhelmed with serious mental health issues. Here's just a sampling of what he told me. Involuntary mental health commitments have tripled in the last few years. And after being found too mentally ill to stand trial, people are waiting in jail twice as long for placements in a state hospital. This tremendous increase in both cases and delays is not limited to one county. It's occurring statewide. But we first need to understand how we got here. Two generations ago, the federal government deinstitutionalized our nation's mental health delivery system. And as psychiatric hospitals across the county shuttered their doors, primary responsibility for the care, treatment, and supervision of those with serious mental illness largely fell to local communities, police, jails, and courts. And today, mental illness permeates nearly every type of case that comes before our judges. In fact, the criminal justice system is now a primary referral source to get a person to obtain mental health treatment. I asked Hendricks County Sheriff and recent president of the Indiana Sheriff's Association, Brett Clark, here today, and this is his quote. The single greatest challenge facing Indiana sheriffs is dealing with serious mental illness in jails. 
Senator Mike Young and Representative Wendy McNamara recently echoed that same sentiment. And to their point, 80% of our current jail populations have mental illness, substance abuse, or co-occurring disorders. Serious mental illness is four to five times more prevalent in jail than the general population. Police officers are not social workers, and jails are not treatment centers. And when we ask them to be, we compromise their core function of preserving public safety, which in turn puts everyone at risk. This year, you, the General Assembly, will be tasked with considering how to best implement the National Mental Health Hotline, better known as 988. It's the future of crisis care, a hotline for mental health emergencies where the immediate crisis response is connected to the infrastructure in place. In anticipation of, your, of this important work, the Supreme Court is convening a statewide summit organized by the cross-branch efforts of Justice Christopher Goff, Sheriff Brett Clark, Senator Jack Salen, Mental Health Director Jay Chaudhry, and Drug Czar Doug Hunsinger. Could you all stand? Thank you for your work across the branches to get this together. <laughs> Teams from all 92 counties with members of their local JRACs you created will collaborate with each other and state-level partners to start developing responsible, cost-effective solutions. Please plan on joining your community's team at the October 21st summit. Consider this an invitation. So to conclude, at the beginning of the address, I told you that today's message is one of perseverance. At a meeting last month with dozens of your trial court judges, I was inspired by what I heard. Judge after judge after judge from counties across the state reported their resolve to hear difficult cases and to handle their dockets fairly and efficiently. And they complimented Hoosiers for wholeheartedly showing up and fulfilling their jury duty obligation. Jackson County Judge Amy Marie Travis, for example, recalled asking jurors after a recent trial, what can the court do to improve their jury experience? You know what they said? They unanimously reported to her they wanted to come back and serve on another jury. How inspiring is that, stepping up to do their responsibility in our republic? We need to give thanks to our jurors, but also our clerks, probation officers, staff, attorneys, justice partners, and all our trial court judges, many of whom are here today. We have a spirit of resilience that is allowing us to fulfill our constitutional promises. And I know you agree with me, a tenacious spirit runs deep in this state. We are proud to stand in service with all of you for all our fellow Hoosiers. Thank you, and may God continue to bless our great state. Thank you very much. The jo this joint session of the Indiana House and Senate is now adjourned. Representative Lehman for a motion. Mr. Speaker, I you second. Uh, there's a motion to second. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The motion is adopted. We are adjourned.